So new sensei, can you let us know some common beginner mistakes that people make? Um, for first timers especially, it's the, the biggest mistake I think is um, worrying too much about hitting the target. Um, it's really not about trying a bullseye or you know, even hitting the target, it's about process. And we often tell people, don't worry about where it lands, just worry about this part. So mm -hmm. we try and teach them good form first, because mm -hmm. good form will lead to good results. Yeah. But uh, naturally, a lot of learners are fixated on bullseyes. It's yeah. like, oh, I missed the bullseye, was a really bad shot, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. But really, it might be a very good shot, mm -hmm. just aim in the wrong place. So uh, we, we can yeah. fix people, we can help people improve if they have good form. Mm -hmm. But if you're worried too much about hitting precise targets, yeah then that can lead to bad habits because you start making things up, you start trying too hard at the target, mm -hmm. and that's what leads to kind of worse results. There are other small things too, uh, things like uh, starting at too high a draw weight. Mm -hmm. So we teach our beginners very light bows. Mm -hmm. um, so that way they have immediate feedback, they can learn good form and have full control. Mm -hmm. Whereas people who shoot with a very high weight, um, they don't have the muscle strength or the stamina to shoot properly. So again, bad habits come in and they might even injure themselves. So, That's very similar yeah. to piano because we start off with learning just note by note first and then combining it one hand at a time and then hands together. But a lot of children or a lot of beginners just want to go straight away hands together. Oh yeah, full size. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So then they don't really just go through the process, it's more like, oh, just do it, you know, just guess their way through. So then oh, yeah, I say advice for you, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know how to shoot with proper form, I just want to shoot bullseye, so I'm just going to kind of figure out the right way to do things, so yeah. it's going to pop targets, hopefully, mm -hmm. it gets it in the middle. Yeah, so then what else is a common mistake that you see? Um, I guess, um, especially buying equipment, buying the wrong thing. Mm. Um, they might spend too much yes. or too little. Yeah, um, so similar to musical yeah. instruments. There's so many different musical instruments that you can buy from the supermarket. Or from eBay. Yeah. You know, like our guys are like, a lot of guys buy from eBay, cheap Chinese made um, knockoff bow. Exactly. It's like, oh, yeah, it costs 200 bucks, so yeah. I'll just do me and I'll, I'll put a bow. But yeah. it's, it's bad. So, how bad is it? Like, you know, I know it's really bad when you've got an instrument <laughs> mm. that is bad quality. If you want to make it to go loud and it doesn't even go loud and it just falls apart. Part, the piano it's just glued together let's say because <laughs> yeah. it does happen there's pianos that are just glued together with plywood and then they sell it at a very <laughs> high price because yeah. they think oh you know the more expensive something is the better yeah, so yeah. when you have a, an instrument i mean a bow that's yeah, which, completely which is our instrument really <laughs> yeah. yeah um yeah a, a cheap bow is there's it's usually a very poor finish mm -hmm. so it's not having the quality polish or that the quality control yeah. there are things which kind of fall apart mm -hmm. um the attachment and accessories are very low quality. It's still having a quality sight or a good release or a good bow in general. Um, you can tell that it's just kind of pieces kind of cobbled together. Yeah. I mean, it functions. Mm -hmm. That's the, the bottom line is if people just want a cheap bow to shoot in the backyard or on their farm, then it works. But then how does it affect your progress? Yeah, on the it wall? doesn't give the right feedback. Yeah. Because certain bows feel better mm -hmm. and it, you kind of know what you're doing when you mm -hmm. hold it and it doesn't feel right. With these other bows, they feel very heavy, the balance is yeah. wrong, and you don't know whether it's you or the bow that's yes. causing your problems. That's such a common problem because a lot of parents, when they talk to me about their child losing motivation, and I can tell that they've been practicing on a keyboard, and the keyboard's not big enough. They've outgrown the keyboard, but the parents haven't invested in a larger digital mm. piano, so they don't actually have enough keys to play on, so they're imagining what the keys <laughs> would be like, and then um, they don't ever have a pedal to play on, so they're kind of like just in the air pedaling, pretending, and the parents go, oh, you know, if they show more motivation, then I will buy him a digital piano mm. but the thing is like you said you know you don't know what to feel you're not feeling anything yeah. because the instrument doesn't do what you want to do you never have enough keys to play on so then you have to remember having the proper instrument or the equipment is so important to keep someone motivated to get them to feel that oh, I am improving I'm actually doing what I need to do mm. so you know it's very important oh well, yeah and again the other one the opposite can happen when people overspend yes. sort of buy something way too good for their level um, and that's not bad necessarily but it does mean that you risk spending too much money on something you don't need yes. and you know going too high too soon we're encouraged by good equipment 
But if you're not at that level and you're spending you know, three thousand mm. dollars the best gear, yes. you're kind of setting yourself way too high. Exactly. And you can't maximize that investment that early. That's a common problem. Like at the music school, we had upright pianos, digital pianos, and a baby grand piano. And a lot of parents walk past my teaching room and go, "I would love to buy that." Oh, so would I. See baby yes. grands, and I want one of those in my yes. house. Except they cost. They cost thirteen thousand dollars. So a lot of the times, I explain to the parent, "You don't need that for a beginner. It's nice. It sounds great." But the thing is. The beginner doesn't need to learn on a baby grand piano. The exams are done on an upright piano, and you really only need to have a baby grand piano if you are doing competitions or if you're planning on doing higher levels, like diploma levels, or going into university. Then so, you need yeah, to. Same, same with archery equipment. Like as much as I say, buy the best bow. Yeah. If, unless you're competing, that really need the very exactly. best. You know, that that's a luxury buy for a lot yeah. of people. So then. Um, it's important to remember that um, you need to have an instrument that can do what you need at that time, and then you know once you outgrow it, then maybe invest in something more. But you don't have to go all out and buy something very professional yet, because a lot of the times you don't know whether you'll commit to it yeah. long term. And the next thing you want, uh, the next thing you don't want, is that you know you've bought something so expensive and then it's just collecting it's dust. Just the decorations, that yeah. It's your three thousand dollar bow to hang on a rack somewhere. Exactly. Or your or your thirteen thousand dollar um, coffee table. You yes. Know, that's the worst. Thing yeah, and it's hard to, to actually sell it as well I when know, you're yeah. wanting it to get out of the house. To actually get piano movers to move a piano is not cheap. And the thing is, it's one of those expenses that people don't realise. Yeah. Well. Thankfully, art equipment is a lot easier to sell, but yeah. a lot of it's personalised. So, yeah. like, if it's just for you, then it can be hard to sell somebody else yeah. who's a different size than you mm. or a different strength than you. So, it's it's easier, and there, there is a very big second-hand archery equipment market. Mm. Um, but yeah, just the investment you put in and not using it that that's very off-putting and yeah. it's just, it's just, at the same time you don't want to go too cheap yeah. and that can ruin your experience as well so exactly. you're going to have a good balance point here mm -hmm. you, you don't want to spend too much at once for your first bow yeah. but you also don't want to spend too little yeah. and have a very tarnished experience so then i want to talk about maintaining the bow because mm -hmm. in piano we need to tune the piano once a year or if you move the piano then you need to actually tune it again so any changes of the piano when you move it around the house or you're moving house, you need to trim the piano once. Um, but if you're keeping it in the same place, then once a year would be great. So with a bow, how do you maintain it? Uh, surprisingly, you can tune a bow. Oh wow! Okay. Both are meant to be tuned. It's my style of In terms of maintenance, you don't need to do that much for mm -hmm. a bow. But because everything interacts in a certain way, mm -hmm. so the arrows and the bow and the string and the draw weight and the accessories. You need to establish a tune for your bow, and that means the arrows must come up straight. Now, if you shoot or you change, for example, your arrows, you need to retune your bow. That means you need to go through a testing, that means you need to shoot a bear shaft or do paper testing to see how the arrow performs mm -hmm. and then make the tweaks so that it comes out just the way it should be. Yeah. So yeah, um, a lot of times we might change parts of our bow. Mm -hmm. It might be broken or we might want to upgrade our bow um, or change our arrows. That means everything we do has to meet a new tune because mm -hmm. when you shoot a bow it's out of tune, yeah. which sounds really weird, yeah. but when you shoot a bow it's not tuned. Um, the performance will not be as, as good. There might yeah. be more erratic patterns. Yes. Um, and you might think you can get things down really narrow, mm -hmm. but the bow itself, it, there's too much variation yeah. it comes out a little wider. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're shooting at 70 meters at a target this small, you don't want that spread. You want yeah. a much narrower spread. So, yeah, it's not really maintenance, it's more of a performance mm -hmm. thing. It's like a car. You yes. want to tune your car so it performs the best it can be. Mm -hmm. And any change you make to your car, you've got to change um, and do a tune and fix it again. Yeah, that's very similar to tuning a piano. Mm -hmm. The reason why we tune the piano is so that it still sounds good and doesn't sound out of tune. Oh, yeah, so it's yeah. more enjoyable for you when you're practicing. Because the last thing you want is to be practicing on an instrument and there's notes that don't come back up when yeah. you play. It's just stuck there. Yeah, or does it sound right? I mean, yeah. you, you still play, it doesn't sound right. Yeah. And it gives the wrong feedback. The same with bow, where yeah. it literally the bow doesn't sound right. Yeah. It sounds different the way it normally should, mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel quite right. Yes. So that can give you misleading feedback. Exactly, and the thing is, you have to be able to enjoy your practice. Yes. That what keeps you going. Yep. Because if you're 
practice is just frustrating because your instrument or your bow is just not performing. Yeah, if you're shooting you poorly and your bow is not right, then yeah. it's frustrating because you're fine, yeah. but the bow isn't. And sometimes you don't recognize that yeah. it's not you this time. Most, yes. most of the time it's you as yes. an archer because you're not doing something right, but sometimes it's not. It's mm. your equipment letting you down. Yes. And that's a common feedback actually on the examiner's comments mm. because I just remembered that one of the comments for my students said that the piano that you were playing on was too old. Mm. So that's the thing when you're purchasing a second-hand instrument as well. So when you buy an instrument, um, yes, a second-hand piano can still cost you $3,000, $4,000. To you it might be very expensive, mm. but it's actually still maybe not um, to the standard of what examiners want. Mm. So. The thing is you have to remember that there's a lot of the times that um, you have to make sure that the instrument is able to perform what you want just because you bought the instrument and yes you might have paid a few thousand dollars for it it might not have been the best as well so then you have to really look into you know when you buy an instrument when you buy brand new there's more warranty there's guarantee for it um, but if you're buying an instrument that's second hand maybe buy something that's less than 10 years old not something that's 30 years old um, but that's um, something I want to ask. So it doesn't matter if we use a bow that's 30 years old? Um, the, the, the technology changes a lot over mm. time. Um, so it's still usable and a lot of the bows which were used 30 years ago were championship winning mm. bows. But now we see changes in materials, we see yes. changes in accessories yes. and some of the older bows are compatible with the current technology which is available. That's very similar to pianos. Like the technology, mm. the make of pianos from 30 years ago is yeah. very different to now as well. I mean, like yeah. Yamaha made bows by the way, because you didn't know that. No, I did not. Yeah, so Yamaha makes they everything. Make bikes, so they, they make similar. motorbikes and yeah. cans and recorders. Yeah. And they, they make bows. They, they just make Yamaha bows. Um, okay. they, they have a lot around here somewhere actually. So, yeah. um, you, you play, you, you can shoot a Yamaha and you play mm -hmm. a Yamaha. Yeah. They're not making bows now. Uh, and then their, their bow technology was really good back then. Mm -hmm. It was like a champion winning bow. Yeah. Uh, and nowadays it's phased out, can't find the accessory for it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's still a good look, but it's a very kind of like an 80s look. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not fashionable anymore. It's still old yeah. school. There has yeah. that appeal to it. Um, but if compared to a modern bow with modern materials, mm -hmm. it doesn't perform as good. Mm -hmm. So if you get one, it's a nice collector's item if yeah. you get one, but um, it's not a performance bow. Yeah. Can you shoot well with it? Yes. But yes. somebody with a better bow with equal skill yeah. would probably be better yeah. in general. So definitely buy something that's a bit newer, yeah. don't go too old, and really be careful what instrument or what bow yeah. you and, and, and part of the problem with old bows is you don't know where to be in, so it, yeah. might, it might be damaged and you yes. can't tell, so you maybe pull it back, it snaps, <laughs> whoops. Same with the piano, yeah. because a lot of students ask me, oh can you see if this piano online is good? And I, go, I can't tell online, I need to play on it, I need to look inside it, I yeah. need to feel it, I need to see everything. I can't look online and go, that's a good piano. I can't go by model number either. It depends on how often the instrument's been used, how has it been maintained, where has it been? Is that same with bow, like if you leave a, a bow in a garage yeah. for like you know, 30 years, yeah. it's probably not going to be in suitable condition. Exactly, or even um, a piano that's been used for five years only. Um, let's say they used it every day, 12 hours. Mm. So that piano, although it's only five years old, but the wear and tear for that is already maybe something that's 30 years old for someone oh, yes. that's been using it just once a week. So it really depends on piano. Um, you can't really go by oh how many years old it is. It really depends on the use of it, where it's been, the condition of the piano inside and out, whether it's rusting or not, mm. um, whether there's mold and chips and cracks. So there's so many things to look at when you're buying an instrument or yeah. a bow that you have to really be careful. Yes. You have to buy the right one for you or no matter how much you practice, you won't progress as well as you want to and then that's going to be very frustrating for you because you'll be scratching your head and going, I'm putting in the practice but why aren't I improving? And a lot of people are reluctant to admit the bug. Yes, exactly. You spend money exactly. on it, it's like, no, it's, it's me, it's me, it's yeah. really me. But um, sometimes just buying the wrong thing just slows you down, stunts you. Yes. 
So, um, are there any other common beginner mistakes that you've seen? Um, so, one's really like buying equipment, one's like yep. going too high. I think, um, yeah, setting high expectations is one of the yep. biggest ones, especially mm -hmm. when you feel good. You want to um, shoot well all the time. Yes. Um, and what do you mean by high expectations? It's not like, like, I want to go competition in six months? It's, it's, more, it's more like scores. I think yeah. we start putting score barriers. Mm -hmm. That's when, um, especially intermediate archers have this problem where their coach or their fellow archers tell them they should be shooting this score by this stage. Think about in six months, you're just scoring 300, and you know, after nine months, you're scoring like, 360. Mm -hmm. But when you don't get there, and you start thinking, oh, I'm not good enough, and yeah. you stress way too much about the score, and that makes you perform worse. Mm -hmm. It also kills your, your fun factor as well, yeah. because you're trying too hard for a score, but you're kind of forcing it to happen, you're not mm -hmm. letting yourself grow naturally. Yeah. So you're artificially setting barriers, yeah. which you don't actually need. So nobody's forcing you mm -hmm. to progress at this rate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think one of the yeah, mistakes is setting expectations too high too yeah. soon. Yeah, I think that's a similar thing to music. We start music lessons and the goal is to be able to play anything we like and be able to read notes and just listen to music and play it straight away. Yeah. And that's the biggest problem. Like even personally, I'm still very slow when I listen to something and then playing it back out on the piano. I still need to figure out note by note and then just kind of hum it out to myself and then figure it out. A lot of people have this expectation when they start music lessons is, oh, you know, I just want to learn to listen to something on the radio and play it out again. Or I just want to be able to play you know, any sheet music just like that at the performance speed. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, that's something that's really hard. Even me, I take time to do that. It's not something that you just can do in six months or one year. It actually takes a lifetime of actually working on it and actually learn how to do it. Some people learnt to play by ear from the very beginning. Mm. They can't read notes. That's why they can play by ear, because that's all they know how to do. And then when you're professionally trained, you have to learn to read the notes. And you don't really develop your um, oral skills. You don't have to listen to the radio and figure it out, because you can read the sheet music. Just go and look for the sheet music on the net, and you'll be able to play the music straight away. So that's the thing with high expectations. A lot of the things take years to develop, many skills, and to be good at anything, it takes years. It's not one year, it's, we're talking about 10 years. Yeah, people don't look really easy. Yeah, like, there's no overlap. Look at how to do it. It looks so easy with yeah. piano or archery. Oh, it looks so good. It's like, yeah. oh, behind that, it's like five years of constant practice. Yeah, so then to be a professional Olympian <coughs> archer, how many years did they train before they got oh, to that? A lot of them start stage? young. So, like, you know, a lot of people are now like 21 to 27 years old. Yeah. They've been doing archery for like, since they were like 12 years old, 10 years old. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you don't have to start young. Yeah. But because you've got like, years, you know, 10 years. Is in it, yeah. yeah. So, you know, many people have a burst where it might be a two or three year kind of sudden growth, but they stay in the sport for like 15 years. So, mm -hmm. it's not just the years, but again, it's the practice involved. Yeah. You know, a year of practice might be 10,000 hours or 20,000 hours. Yeah. So, you can say, I've been doing for five years, but how much have I actually practiced? If it's once a week for five years, that's not five years. Yeah. That's different. Exactly. So, there's a um, Chinese saying that they say, what you see as, um, a success story usually they spent 10 years off stage mm. out of the spotlight refining their art learning what they're doing well and then once you see them being successful it's already taken 10 years to get there it's actually not something that they did in mm. one week but there's a lot of things that you don't see and in sports as well there's so many sportsmen and um, yeah, athletes. just athletes yeah. Yeah, that we look up to, but then we don't see all of the sweat, the yeah, tears, the, the frustration, it, yeah. and all that that goes behind it. With singers, actors, a lot of them, they had to really go through a hard time on just being rejected, on failing, on actually practicing. Yeah, and, and in sports, the burnout is real. Yeah. Like you see some young athletes retire early and yeah. might think, oh, well, why do you retire? You had like you know, 10 more years to go. Yeah. But the stress and the workload and the intensity and the toll it takes on you, yeah. that can really wear you down. I mean, it's, it's easy to say as a casual shooter yeah. that, oh yeah, I could do art for 10 years. But when you're trying to do this seven days a week <laughs> you know, and try to maintain those standards, that is both physically and mentally exhausting. 
that's definitely something that I didn't consider as well. Like just the amount of stress that goes into being a professional, that's something. So then um, how do you switch off from this and try to deal with that stress? Since it's not just shooting a bow anymore. Yeah. You've got It's a so lifestyle many, now. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a part lifestyle. Of life. So then how do you manage your time to be able to do everything and then once you have to focus just switch off and just do what's at hand. Well, pretty much that. Like, you know, when, when you're in practice, you switch off. Yeah. I think a, a lot of uh, problems come because people who do archery bring baggage with them. Yeah. It might be, you know, a family issue, it might be work, it might be stress, something to do with fun. Or their mind can't want yeah, this because when wonders. I'm practicing piano, I go, oh, I'm going to have a dinner, I'm going to have a lunch. See, I would do that too if yeah. I was like, yeah, just. Gone exactly, it's, it's, it's so individual that you, you, it's, it's autopilot, yeah. and you start thinking about other things, and that gets to you. So it's it, 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 there's no way around it. It's just yeah. simply you have to prioritize. Go mm-hmm. today, I'm going to put a hundred percent in this activity, yeah. whether it's your training, whether it's your job, whether it's your family. What you are doing right now is a hundred percent, not fifty percent now, fifty percent later. It has to be a hundred percent right now in this spot here. I think that's the key to success. Anything well, really, yeah, yeah. Anything is what you're doing right now is hundred yeah. percent. Not what happened before, not what happens next, but what yeah. you're doing right now. I think that's mm-hmm. really what it is. It's not, it's not really a sports skill. It's a life skill. Yeah, that's very important. What you said, it's a life it's skill. A life skill yeah. It's not just something that you just do temporarily. Yeah, no, no, I'm doing sport now. I'm gonna focus really hard now. Yeah. Everything you do needs focus. Even if you don't like it, it might be like yeah. homework, it might be mm. schoolwork. If you don't exactly. like it, well, too bad. Mm. But you put hundred percent, you get it done really well. Yeah. And you walk away, you put it behind you. Like, yeah. You don't want to leave things back in your mind. I think that's for everything. Balance mm. is very important. And if you're, you know, prioritizing things in the wrong way, you're spending too much time stressing about one thing, yeah. then maybe think about your overall life balance more so than your performance in the sport or music. Yeah, that's a very common mistake. I just realized with my students, they bring their stress from school. Mm. I've got an assignment due tomorrow, and they're just talking about their assignment or oh, lesson. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, this is your piano lesson. You need to focus. You've got an assignment due. You can do it after you finish your lesson and when you go home. But don't bring that stress from school to your lesson. And that way, you're not going anywhere with your music lesson. Then you might end up bringing the stress from your music lesson into your schoolwork when you're doing your assignment. Mm. So then, what you said, that tip, you know, focus 100% on what you're doing. Um, don't bring the stress of different areas of your life into one particular thing because you end up burning out. Yeah, and critically, it happened to me a lot. Like, if I don't feel 100% in the space here right now in practice, I might not practice. Mm. If I have to deal with like work from home or something, yeah. and that's in the back of my mind, I come here, I'm just going to go home and deal with that. I mm. deal with that the stress then, yeah. and I come back with an open, fresh mind. Yes. It, it's a hard tool. You want to maintain your routine, yeah. but sometimes it gets to the point where, look, I'm going to have a bad session. I mm. know I will. Mm. I'm going to deal with my problem first. Yeah. That's a good thing because once you can overcome this, learning to do everything 100% at hand, that's the key to success. It's pretty much, you know, all of us want to do well in what we do, but we don't understand why, well, that person, how come they've got so much motivation and drive to do what they're doing? Why can't they achieve one thing after another? And the key is because they just focus on what they're doing. Like, they're doing so many different projects, but then they're doing a hundred percent of work on each project they put in a hundred percent no matter what it is if they're not good at it they will research they will learn the mm. skills required to do that yeah so you can't do bare minimum sort of thing yeah so then um pretty much anyone who is successful they can just learn to focus a hundred percent give it all they've got because what have you got to lose if you tried your best and you know that well you know I've learned something and now I know that mistake's not bad well let me use this to help me be better and that's the mindset you have to actually always focus a hundred percent on what you do whether it's sports or music and thrive on failures thrive on making mistakes because you know that better to make it now during practice than to make it on the field when you're at a competition yeah. or in an exam or on stage in front of hundreds of people. 
Yeah, and often they're like, people will praise you and say you're doing really nicely. Yeah. They're not helping you. Yeah. Really, like, uh, it feels good. I mean, yes. they don't say, don't praise me. They don't say, oh, I hate you, suck. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, the, the praise makes you feel good, but you don't learn from your mm. praise. You don't learn yeah. from success, you learn from failures. Yes. So when people point things out which might be wrong, or when, when you, you know something's not quite right, rather than ignore it, it's the one thing you should listen to. Mm. Because, look, maybe they're wrong, and mm. that's fair. You might disagree, you can't act on the feedback, it's not, it's not good feedback. Yeah. But if it's something which you know is wrong, mm. then own it. Yes. It's something which you, uh, if you have a bad practice in, instead of pushing away, think, well, what was wrong with that? Mm-hmm. Because that is a learning opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, if you had a really bad competition, sure, feel good about yourself if you tried your best and all mm-hmm. that too. That, that, that's a healthy mindset to have. Yeah. But also think about, you know, why, why did I not perform as well? Well, what can I do better next time? Mm-hmm. So think forward, think, be optimistic about yeah. it. Um, but yes, you've got to put yourself through the highs and the lows mm-hmm. in order to make those, those, uh, those, those jumps, those leaps. Yeah. So are there any other common beginner mistakes that you've seen also? Oh, well, there, there are so many. Oh, no, there's like, so yeah, many. It's the same bad thing. Like, people mm-hmm. go through, you know, they learn differently, they make different mistakes, some are mental, some are physical. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard to go through a lot of them right yeah. now. But yeah, I think those main ones are, you know, setting high expectations, buying equipment you don't need, yes. or not spending enough on equipment. Um, and things like pushing yourself too far too soon. Like, mm-hmm. That's really what it comes down to. Well, that's good. So then um, that leads me to my last question. What advice do you have for people who are starting out as a manager and who want to commit to a sport? Well, my advice is your first taste of archery is going to be just a taste. Mm -hmm. Like, do it for fun. Like, don't try to be too good Mm -hmm. on your first session. You're learning. Mm -hmm. And learning takes time. So my Mm -hmm. first advice is in your first few weeks, just enjoy it. Mm -hmm and immerse yourself in the sport. Mm. And I think that's really what it is, is the more you make it part of your lifestyle, mm. the better you become, the faster you become good at it. Mm. If it's something you only do once in a while, yeah. don't expect to become good yeah. at anything. But if it's something you do frequently, like you start going every week, so mm. every month, every week, yeah. and then it becomes every you know, twice a week mm. or you know, three times a week, the more it's part of you, the more you own it and the yeah. more you want to become good at it. Yeah. Um, that's really my main advice is yeah. like if you actually want to progress, you have to put in the time, mm-hmm. you have to make it part of your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. If it's something you do as a part-time thing, mm-hmm. then likewise with any part-time commitment, you're not going to be as adept in it in as short a time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you have to be realistic with all the things. Um, if you want to become an Olympian, you've got to train mm-hmm. and actually train and learn from your mistakes. If you're doing it for fun, then your expectation shouldn't be as high. Enjoy yourself, mm-hmm. but I think at the same time, appreciate that you can become better if you choose to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for that advice because that's very similar to music as well. Mm-hmm. Have fun, make it as your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're taking it seriously, then have realistic expectations and you, know, you do need to put in the time, the mm-hmm. effort. Um, so then, with all of that advice of what you need to be good at archery, it's the same with music as well. So you need to put in the time and effort. You really need to take it seriously, put in 100%. Thank you, New Sensei, for being here today. It was great having a chat with oh, you. Fun, and just yeah, comparing the similarities and differences with sports and music. But I think there's more similarities than differences, to be honest, with oh, yeah, sports and music. I agree, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of people think they're separate things, but I think yeah. that uh, really, like, learning anything mm. um, has a lot of the same, you know, problems and same mm. benefits. So, um, mm. yeah, I, I think it's really nice to compare these yes. two things. I've learned so much from you, Sensei, today. I'm Lena from Lena's Music House. Thank you for watching and see you next time.